Paul Richardson is known to some of you. I'm meeting him for the first time. He's the author of a new book called A Certain Risk, Living Your Faith at the Edge. Uh, remarkably well-written book, Paul. Welcome. Thank you. It's great, great to be here. Great to have you here. When were you here last? Do you remember? I think it was about two years ago. About two years ago. I, I, that picture we pulled up for the opener was from then, and I, right. you know, I, I, I wasn't here at that time, so I, this is my first time meeting you. Right. It's a book purportedly about faith, and in many ways it is, but it's also about much more, in my it view. Uh, that's my, my view as a reader. Yeah. I want to throw something at you. Before we sure. talk about what you do in Indonesia and growing up there and all that kind of stuff, okay. get off my back, Vincent. I have no trouble with my canvas, uh -huh. you say to Vincent van Gogh. Right. But the artist buried in my soul wouldn't let me off that easily. Mm. Van Gogh's words were striking a little too close to my heart. What is this sickness in me? I call it creative lethargy. Creative lethargy, a suffocating vacuum that smothers passion, innovation, and negates opportunities. This sickness bleeds my imagination dry, isolates me from the suffering of those around me. Do you have a bit of Vincent van Gogh in you? I think I do. I think we all do. But you see yourself as an artist. I do, yes. Which is interesting because for 20 years you've been a teacher, and you are, what, you call yourself a change specialist. Right. Uh, you're living in Indonesia. You grew up in Indonesia. Mm -hmm. uh, we're going to hear about all of that. Mm -hmm. But when you, when you write so transparently here, mm -hmm. um, creative paralysis drains my soul of God's dreams. Do you feel creatively paralyzed at times? I do. And I believe that God has created me to be a person who overflows and who makes an effect in the world around me. And so throughout the pages of this book, I portray my environment and the people around me as like being a, a blank canvas and God giving me the chance every single day to create with my words, with my attitudes, uh, and to uh, be on the receiving end of what he wants to say through me and, and create through me in order to bring his life and hope and beauty into the world around me. You know, I'm not surprised to hear you say that because mm -hmm. you, you pick up a book, you know, some, in some bookstore, Living Your Faith at the Edge. What you're expecting here is a kind of a, an analysis of faith, a delineation of points, uh, a how-to book. Mm -hmm. None of that is here. This is very much like a canvas. It's, it's, the book is very much like a painting. Mm -hmm. uh, it's, that's the impression I got as I read yeah. it, not having talked to you. Now, all the more so, it, it seems that way to me. Uh, it's, uh, as I said to you off camera, it's kind of like faith in Kodachrome. Um, let, let's, let's, let's go back to the beginning. Sure. Uh, were you born in Indonesia? I was. I was born in a, a remote place in a village that no longer exists because the ocean has washed it away. Wow. <laughs> How's that feel? I mean, <laughs> your physical roots yeah. are gone. Yeah. No, it's great. But I get to go back there. You know, uh, about once a year. Well, I look out at the water. And, <laughs> yeah, I go back and, and visit those villages in the jungle yeah. and your parents were doing what? Uh, in 1962, my parents went in there. They got into a dugout canoe and paddled 20 miles into the jungle uh, to settle amongst a tribe called the Sawi people. And they spent the next 16 years amongst those people. Uh, my father translated the scripture into their language. My mother worked as a nurse every single day, uh, bringing love and, and care uh, to, to the people who were sick. Um, you grew up kind of like... Um Son of Tarzan. <laughs> I mean, you, you, you talk in the book about running free in the, in, in the, in the jungle and yes. uh, just living like a typical Indonesian kid out there. I was a little boy that grew up uh, barefoot. And first thing I'd pick up every morning is my bow and arrow, and I'd be running out in the jungle uh, with my friends who were part of the tribe. And that was my formative years uh, were, were in that sort of environment. Do you miss that? I... I do, and I, and I think I will always carry a little bit of that tribal feel in my soul for the rest of my life. Hmm. I look a certain way from the outside, but on the inside, I'm something totally different. Yeah. <laughs> uh, do you ever run into those uh, jungle friends now that they're adults? I do. I was just there a few months ago. And what do you talk about? We talk about the old days and the stories of being together and, and the, uh, the times when, when our family lived there and we'd go out and paddle in our canoes and swim in the river and be terrified of, of saltwater crocodiles together and uh, have snakes come into our house at night. Um, so yeah, a lot of memories with, mm. with our tribe out there. Mm.
And of course, uh, you're speaking to them in their language, not English. Right, yeah. How old were you when you left? I was 10. You were 10? Yeah. And f you went from there to where? I moved from there to Victoria, B.C. Now, how does a 10-year-old kid who's just been running free in the jungle put up with Victoria, B.C., as beautiful as it is? I mean, you must have gone through major culture shock. It was totally different. It was like moving to a new planet. Yeah. And uh, I would, you know, I found myself in what felt like freezing cold to me because I'd been raised on the equator in the, in the heat and humidity. And then moving to Canada, it was shocking to me. I'd get on a bus and drive across Victoria every day and go to school and and everything was new. It was shocking. <laughs> oh, really? Yeah. Uh, were you able to cope with that as a kid? And did it uh, upset your equilibrium? Did you have a sense of dislocation? I find that children have a way of adapting faster than adults do. Yeah. Uh, yeah. Huh. Did you have siblings, brothers, sisters? Two older brothers, one sister. Wow. Yeah. So the four of you were in that Indonesian setting. So how is yeah. it that you found your way back to Indonesia? Well, I lived in Southern California, Los Angeles, for a good 20 years of my life and, and uh, worked in inner city schools there, started a charter school in a pretty rough community. And it, it was a little bit of an ur urban jungle, you might say, uh, uh, drive-by shootings and uh, just working with gang members. And I did that for seven years. And, and then through the process of that time, the Spirit of God just began speaking to me and to my wife and telling us that it was time to uh, chart a new path. And so we put out the word and, and recruiters, uh, you know, called us out to Indonesia and we said, let's go. Let's, let's see where God, what God has for us out there. And, and a new adventure began. Now, the day that you were to leave or about the day you were to leave, you had a real traumatic experience. I did. Tell yeah. us about that. Well, this was uh, eight o'clock in the morning. We were getting packed, ready to go to the airport to hop on a 747 jet, fly overseas. This is a day we dreamed about for years. Uh, it, was, it was a day of transition for us, um, and suddenly we couldn't find our son. Who was nine months old. Nine months old, had just learned how to crawl, and earlier that morning I had been outside. At, at the house we were staying in at the time, there was a swimming pool there, and uh, I had been out swimming laps that morning, and when I came in, forgot to close the door, side door out to the pool, and my little boy, Josiah, decided to crawl out and, and take a swim. And sometime later, we don't know how long, maybe 10 minutes, maybe five minutes, we found him lying at the bottom of that swimming pool. I dove in, swam down to the bottom, picked him up. And when my, uh, when my face emerged out of that water, heard my wife screaming for her son, and it dawned on me that, that our son had drowned. And then over the next three days, we experienced uh, chaos, and we experienced the extreme of emotions uh, going from the uh, grief and tragedy of losing our son and then seeing God doing an amazing miracle to bring him back and, get, no. and restore his life to no, us. No, was, was it your, your brother-in-law who gave him uh, CPR immediately? My brother. Or your brother. He yeah. was there. He, mm -hmm. and, and then, yeah. and then um, somebody called the fire department right. and the fire department called a helicopter to airlift him to the hospital. Yes. Um, right. and